We had checked the great peril that had hung over us, but we found, as the centuries and ages passed, that we had only checked it, that we had not banished it. For nothing in the universe could halt the cooling of Neptune and Triton. As their interior fires cooled, colder and colder grew their surfaces, despite the roofs that enclosed them. It was then that we had recourse to another means of halting that oncoming cold, the use of artificial heat. We set up in the giant compartment city of Neptune, and in that of Triton also, great globes that radiated out unceasing and intense heat. These globes held inside them their own mechanisms, mechanisms that could change etheric vibrations of electricity and light and others into heat vibrations by changing their wavelength. And with these radiating their ceaseless heat, and with the great enclosing roofs, the oncoming cold was again checked. Yet after a time we were forced to recognize that this check also was but temporary. For we were fighting the most grim and hopeless battle in the universe. We were fighting against the relentless and inevitable changes caused by the immutable physical laws of the universe. So that, aid its failing heat as we might with artificial heat producers, the interior heat of Neptune was waning still, and more and more globe heat radiators were required to keep the temperature of Neptune at its usual height. The Neptunians of Triton were faced with the same problem, but their situation was not so desperate as of those upon Neptune, since though Triton had cooled as quickly, its enclosed space was so much smaller than Neptune's, its great roof so close to it also, that it was possible with an effort to keep enough heat mechanisms going there to maintain the warmth. On Neptune, however, the struggle became more and more desperate, our great struggle against the blind laws of nature. For as Neptune's interior heat declined farther and farther, it became more and more impossible for us to keep enough heat mechanisms going to keep it warm enough for life. And at last, after years upon years of that awful struggle against fate, we of Neptune realized at last that it was no longer possible to keep Neptune warm enough for us to exist there and that we must leave it at once for some other world if we were to escape extinction. Since, as the great planet's interior heat declined, it became more and more agonizing for us to keep enough heat for life by means of the heat mechanisms, and it was clear to all that the end was at hand unless we left Neptune. But where could we go? Even if one of the other planets were suitable to receive us, we could not have transported all our masses from Neptune to another planet in time to escape the doom of cold and death that was closing down upon Neptune. To transport all those masses would have required countless trips with our limited number of cylinders, and to take refuge upon another planet, even had time been ours, was almost out of the question. For long our scientists had studied the other planets with their instruments, and though some of them were so cloud-wreathed and others so distant as to make observation difficult, it had long been known to us that none of the other planets, due to their natural conditions or to the presence of intelligent alien beings already upon them, would be possible as a world for us Neptunians. It was for those reasons, indeed, that no expeditions of cylinders had ever been sent to the other planets. There remained, then, but one place where we might go, but one place to which our millions might go before Neptune's cold grew too great for life. That place was Triton, our peopled moon. For peopled as that moon was with its own masses of Neptunians, struggling against the same menacing cold that had vanquished us on Neptune, it was the one refuge for our peoples. By crowding into its every corner, the countless millions of Neptune's peoples would be able to exist upon Triton. And thou, H, the cooling of Triton, had menaced it with cold also, it has been found, as we have mentioned, that it was not so hard to keep Triton warm by means of the artificial globular heat mechanisms, the space enclosed by its great spherical roof being much smaller. It was a desperate expedient, truly, to mass all the thronging millions from the compartment city that covered all giant Neptune, to mass all those millions upon little Triton, yet that was the one expedient open, and so it was followed at once. Out from Neptune to Triton went all the cylinders of both worlds, loaded with as many Neptunians as they could carry, depositing those Neptunians upon Triton and racing back for more. Countless trips made those thousands of cylinders, trip after swift trip, each occupying but little time because Triton was so near. 
And so at last there came a day when the whole of Neptune's millions had been transported out to Triton, when there remained on Neptune itself no single one of our races, our giant world lying cold and deserted and dead, no longer a habitable world, its vast compartment city empty of the millions that had for ages swarmed through it, while all those millions were crowded now upon little Triton. And so crowded were those vast hordes of the Neptunian races that for a time it seemed that they could not exist in such numbers upon Triton. This crowding was made less acute, however, by an expedient now adopted by us. As mentioned, the Neptunians who had settled upon Triton long before had found that the unchanging day on one side of it and the unchanging night on the other were inconvenient for them after the alternations of Neptune's day and night, and so had begun the custom of spending a day of ten hours upon the sunlit side of Triton and a night of equal length upon the dark side. And now we found that we could make the crowding of our races upon Triton less acute by having half of them working and active upon the sunward side for ten hours while the other half slept through their night on the dark side. Every ten hours these two halves of our people changed sides, changed from day to night, a signal having been devised to mark the hour for that change, a signal which consisted of a brilliant band of intense light that passed swiftly around both Triton's dark and sunward sides. With this shifting of our peoples each ten hours, it was possible to make use of all of Triton's surface, and thus the crowding of our peoples upon it was made less acute. Yet that crowding was still very great. All the thronging Neptunians that had existed upon the surface of giant Neptune had been poured out on little Triton, far, far less in size than its great parent world. And thus, though they could exist upon it, it was existence only that was possible to the Neptunians on Triton, since this awful crowding would grow worse, we knew, rather than better. And also, and more important, here on Triton, the same deadly menace that had driven us from Neptune was again confronting us. For even as Neptune had cooled, Triton had cooled, was cooling also. And though we strained every effort to keep the warmth in Triton constant, though we sent cylinders constantly back to dead and deserted Neptune to bring from it more heat mechanisms and other needed mechanisms, we found that even as on Neptune we were fighting a losing battle with nature. For Triton was cooling was cooling still farther and soon would be completely cold and dead, its interior heat gone out into space. And when that happened, no number of heat mechanisms could keep warmth upon it, even beneath the great enclosing roof, and all life on it must perish. The Neptunian races had come to their last stand, crowded upon our refuge of Triton, striving with all our power to keep upon it the warmth without which we could not live, we saw at last that some new and radically different plan must be found, or we could no longer exist. So all the greatest of our Neptunian scientists were K, led together by us, the Council of Thirty. Into a great conclave here on Triton they were called, and to them, without equivocation of any sort, and to the races of the Neptunians, the situation that confronted us was stated. We had been driven from Neptune by the relentless growing cold, and now that same cold was upon us here at Triton, was threatening us here also with annihilation. How were we to meet this great menace that threatened to wipe us out? Countless were the plans that were advanced in answer to that menace by our scientists. The first, and most obvious plan, was migration to another planet. But here we were checked by the same considerations that had made us unwilling to try that before, for we knew by observation of the other planets that upon none of them could we live as we lived upon Neptune. Some of them were greater in size than Neptune, with greater gravitational power, and that was a difficulty that could not be overcome by us, since upon those planets our weight would be so increased as to make us helpless, even had those planets been fit for our life. Some planets were peopled by intelligent and powerful races which we might be able to conquer after terrible struggles. Others were too near the sun for us to ever inhabit them, who had evolved on the dim, cool world of Neptune, the outermost world. Other planets, as far as we could tell, were quite uninhabitable. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. Not one of them was suitable as a world for us Neptunians. And we had, also, no desire to move to another planet. In truth, 
since so many ages had it taken for us to build our great compartment cities upon Neptune and Triton, to shield them with their great roofs, that it was impossible for us to leave them, even had we been able to start anew upon another world. We must remain with our own great world, it was plain, but how then could we continue to live? Innumerable were the suggestions that were advanced, but even those who advanced them were forced to admit them impracticable. Scores upon scores of useless plans were submitted to us, but none held even a shadow of hope for us, and it was not until we of the Council of Thirty had come to despair almost of warding off the doom that threatened us, that a plan was finally advanced by which that doom could indeed be halted. That plan, put forth by three of our Neptunian scientists in cooperation, was one of such colossal nature that even we Neptunians, who had roofed our worlds and had fought for so long the forces of nature, were stupefied by it. These three Neptunian scientists, in stating their plan, stated first that it was apparent to all that no escape to other planets was possible for us, and that our races must remain at Neptune and its moon for life or death. They stated that it was equally clear that no means could be found by which even Triton could be kept heated artificially. All such means suggested requiring such vast expenditures of energy as to make them impossible for any but the shortest period of time. These premises, they said, were clear indeed, and it was equally clear that unless a new source of heat were found in some way for Neptune and its moon, we races of Neptunians must swiftly die. And so these three suggested a source of heat that never even had occurred to any of the rest of us, suggested the sun, the sun as a source of heat for us. The idea seemed incredible to us, the Council of Thirty. For to us of Neptune, lying so far out in space from the sun, that sun could never mean and had never meant what it does to you of the inner planets. To you, it is a source of ceaseless blazing heat, of brilliant light, warming your world sometimes to scorching, no doubt. But to us that sun has seemed always but a tiny little disk of fire far off in the void from us, a little sun disk that gives to us the dim light of our pale Neptunian day, but that gives to us hardly any measurable heat whatever. We had simply never thought of the sun at all as a source of heat, any more than you would think of a star as a source of heat since we had been accustomed always to rely upon the interior heat of Neptune for our existence. But now with that interior heat gone, with Neptune cold and dead beneath the zero temperatures that reigned there, and with Triton fast approaching the same condition, these three Neptunian scientists advanced the sun as a possible source of heat that might save us. The sun, they admitted, was too infinitely far from us to help us any with its heat as conditions were. But what, they asked, if the sun were to divide into a double or multiple star? Countless stars of the universe, we knew, had done so, had split into a double or triple or multiple star, and in so dividing, by reason of their rotatory speed or centrifugal force, growing so great as to make it impossible for them to hold together, the two or more small suns, forming out of one, always moved some distance apart from each other, by the first force of their division. If the sun were to divide into a double star, therefore, the two smaller suns that would be formed thus would undoubtedly follow the same course, would be pushed apart from each other by the very force of their division, some two billion miles, our astronomers had calculated. Pushed apart thus, the two new suns would form an ordinary double star, or binary, the two revolving around each other. And by their division, almost all the planets of the solar system would without doubt be engulfed in one or the other of the two suns. The four inner planets would inevitably be annihilated when the sun split into two suns, when those two rushed apart from each other. For if they were not directly in the path of the two separating suns, they would be drawn into those separating suns almost at once by the tremendous gravitational disturbances attendant upon this tremendous cataclysm. They would have no more chance of life, indeed, than midges in a great blaze. And in the same way, Jupiter and Saturn would be whirled out of their orbits, since those orbits would be fatally confused and changed by the first division of the Sun, and by the loss of centrifugal force attendant upon their confused slowing they, too, would without doubt be drawn into the path of one or the other of the separating suns and perish in them. And even Uranus would meet a doom as inevitable, 
since with a distance of two billion miles between them, the two new suns would be resting almost exactly upon Uranus's orbit, and so that world too would go to blazing death in one or the other of them. But Neptune would not, for Neptune, farther out than Uranus, farthest out of all the planets, would be the one planet in the solar system that would escape the tremendous cataclysm due to its distance from the sun. When the two suns separated, Neptune's orbit would probably change a little. It would probably sweep closer in toward those suns for some distance. But except for that, it would be unchanged and would by reason of its great distance continue to circle in its curving path through space but would circle then around these two new suns instead of around the former single sun. And with those two suns separated as they were, by a distance of two billion miles, Neptune would be near always to one of those suns, because it would undoubtedly sweep nearer to them when the cataclysm occurred, and would take up an elliptical orbit about them with the two suns as the foci of that ellipse. Thus, it would always be near enough one of them to gain from it, or from both, a large amount of heat. For not only would Neptune in its elliptical orbit be far, far closer to them thus, but the other planets hurtling into them would tend to make them hotter. Thus Neptune, revolving close about the two suns, would gain from them the warm, life-giving heat that it had never gained from the single sun. That heat would thus solve the great problem that faced us. It would halt the doom that was closing down on us. For that heat would so warm Neptune that we could go back again and take up our existence once more upon it free from all peril, could live again in that great compartment city that covered all Neptune. And Triton, too, would be livable then. For the great roofs that we had erected around Neptune and its moon would tend to make of both worlds great hothouses in effect, the sun's or sun's mall, heat being able to penetrate down through those roofs. And with those enclosing roofs about us and with the two new suns close, we could live on in safety. For the enclosing roofs themselves would prevent any inconvenience from the fact that Neptune now and then would be farther from the two suns than at other times, those great roofs keeping a constant warmth upon Neptune and its moon. Thus all the great peril that confronted us would be thrust back, and we could live once more on Neptune, more warm and comfortable there than ever before we could pour back once more to our mighty world that lay now dead and cold and deserted, could do all this if the sun did divide into a double star. Yet what hope was there that this could happen? We knew that the reason other suns of the universe divide into double or multiple stars is because they have reached a rate of rotatory speed that makes it impossible for them longer to hold together. For when a sun is spinning its mass, tends to split up by its own centrifugal force, just as a turning wheel, and the faster the sun spins, the greater grows its centrifugal force, the greater its tendency to split. And then at last, that rate of spin grows so great, and its centrifugal force is such that its mass can no longer hold together, and fission takes place, the sun dividing into two or three or even more stars that push apart from each other. But what chance was there of the sun doing this? For the sun, we knew, rotated at the speed of one turn in 25 days at its equator, and to split it would have to be rotating at a speed of one turn in an hour. That meant that it would be unthinkable eons before the sun's rotatory speed would have increased to that point. For though a sun's rotatory speed does increase as time passes, due to the shrinkage of its mass, it increases so infinitely slowly that it would be eons, indeed, before the sun's rate of spin would be so great as to cause its division, and thus there seemed small hope indeed in that plan. Then it was that those scientists revealed to us the heart of their plan, and made clear to us the true colossal nature of their suggestion. What, they asked, if we ourselves increase the sun's rotatory speed? What if we of Neptune should reach across the void of almost three billion miles and set the sun to spinning faster, spinning it ever faster and faster until it had reached the critical point, until it turned once in one hour. Fission would result then, the sun would divide into a double star as they had calculated, and all the benefits mentioned would come to us, and Neptune and its moon would be warmed always by the heat of the two suns about which they would revolve. If we could do that, 
If we could reach across the void and set the sun to spinning ever faster, it would soon divide into two new suns, and thus we would have saved ourselves. Yet, we were thunderstruck by this suggestion of the Neptunian scientists. To reach out across the infinite leagues of space that lay between our outermost planet and the sun, to turn that sun ever faster until it split into a double star, however could such a gigantic stupefying feat as that be accomplished? But the Neptunians who had suggested this plan now calmly explained how that colossal deed could be accomplished. Long before, indeed, we had discovered force vibrations, finding them a vibration that exerted tangible and definite pressure or force upon whatever matter they struck. And we had used those force rays in some ways. We had used them to propel our cylindrical ve hickles out through space from Neptune to Triton, and vice versa. We had used them also, concentrated into slender, pencil-like rays of great power, as weapons, since those concentrated rays penetrated and destroyed all that they touched. Now our scientists proposed to use them for this huge plan, to reach across the void, across the solar system, and to turn the sun ever faster, until the desired division of it had happened. Nor was this, as they outlined it, impracticable. The sun, turning there in space at the center of the solar system, has naturally one edge or limb turning away from us, and the other turning toward us. Now if we constructed colossal generators of the force vibrations, generators that could produce a gigantic ray that would have almost inconceivable power, and shot that ray across the solar system toward the edge of the sun, turning away from us, what would happen? It was clear that that great ray, striking against the side of the sun's mass turning away from us, striking that side with titanic pressure and force, would tend to turn that side faster away from us, would tend in that way to make the whole sun turn faster. Such a gigantic ray, though it would increase the sun's spin, thus but slowly, would continue to increase the sun's spin steadily as long as it was kept turned upon the sun's side. Slowly but steadily, the sun would turn ever faster until soon it would have reached that critical rotatory speed of one turn in one hour that would make its centrifugal force so great as to make it divide into a double star and so save us of Neptune from the cold death that hung over us. Thus, this mighty plan was presented to us, and it was at once accepted by us of the Council of Thirty, by all of the Neptunian races. For we saw that in it lay our one chance for life, our one chance to halt the doom of our races, our worlds, and to halt that doom we were willing to make any effort. We knew that the other planets of the solar system, that the seven other worlds of this universe and all their moons, would go to flaming death when our plan succeeded, would be annihilated when the sun divided, but we recked not of that. For the last necessity was upon us, the last closing down of the doom that we had fought against so long, and to remove the shadow of that doom from over us, we were willing to send to a more terrible doom all the other planets of the solar system. Only one great difficulty lay before us. That gigantic ray could be generated and shot forth by us, since it would not be difficult by concentrating all efforts to construct the generators and mechanisms needed, but from what place was that ray to be shot toward the sun, and how? It was evident that the giant ray could not be sent from Neptune's surface. For not only would it be almost impossible to keep its great mechanism working in the constant terrible cold that reigned there, but Neptune's rotation would make it impossible to send the ray forth from any spot on the great planet, since because of Neptune's rotation, it would follow that that spot, that great ray, would be toward the sun half the time, on Neptune's sunward side, and the other half would have turned and point away into space from its dark or outer side. It was apparent, therefore, that the great ray could not be sent forth from Neptune, since to achieve its effect, that ray must play constantly upon the sun's one side or edge, and it became apparent that only from Triton could it be sent forth, since Triton kept one face always toward the sun, and it would therefore be necessary only to set the great ray's mechanisms in that sunward side, when it would point unchangingly toward it. As far as position was involved, therefore, it was quite feasible to drive the colossal force ray out from Triton's sunward side toward the sun. But there was another point involved, one that bid fair to ruin the whole great plan. 
When this gigantic force ray reached out across the gulf and struck the sun, it would push the sun's side with inconceivable power as was planned, with a power great enough to turn that sun's titanic mass faster. It would be, in effect, like a solid arm reaching forth from Triton to press against the sun's edge. But the sun is gigantic, is millions of times greater in mass than Triton, and so what would be the result of that great pressure of the ray? It would, without doubt, turn the huge mass of the sun with that pressure very slowly, but it would, by that pressure, and by its reaction, push back against the infinitely smaller mass of Triton itself, and push it away from the sun. It would push it back away from the sun with such colossal power that Triton would be torn loose from the grip of Neptune, its parent world, would be torn loose almost instantly from the solar system itself, and would be hurtled straight out into the awful void of interstellar space away from the sun and all its planetary worlds. It was the same principle, indeed, as that of our cylindrical space flyers. Those cylinders, generating inside themselves a powerful force ray, shot that force ray down against the planet upon which they were. But that force ray, striking with great pressure from the comparatively tiny cylinder to the great planet, did not move the planet, of course, with its push. It moved instead the cylinder itself, hurtling it upward from the planet, because its mass was so infinitely smaller than the planet's. And it would be the same way with Triton and the Sun. For Triton, sending forth the great force ray generated upon it, toward the turning sun's edge, pressing against the sun's huge mass with colossal power, would not move the sun, would not turn it noticeably faster as we planned, but would move Triton itself out from the solar system into the void of space. Almost instantly, by that terrific push, Triton would be hurled out into the awful gulf of space, and thus by that terrific push outward, would be torn loose from the attraction of the sun and its planets forever, and would by its own inertia shoot out through the interstellar void for all time. And that meant, of course, death for all the massed Neptunian races upon Triton, since in the sunless, awful void of space outside our universe, our solar system, they would at once perish. This seemed indeed the difficulty, which was to make our great plan impossible but with only that obstacle standing between us and success, we did not despair, but sought to overcome it. And at last we found a remedy for this difficulty, found a means by which it might be overcome. Triton would be pushed out into the gulf of space away from the solar system forever when its great force ray struck the sun's edge. But what, it was asked, if Triton were braced against the push outward of that great ray, were braced by a great force ray of equal colossal power shooting out from it in an opposite direction against some great mass, tending in that way to push Triton inward toward the sun, even as the great ray striking the sun would tend to push it outward. The result would be, obviously, that Triton would be pushed on either side by the two opposing great force rays with equal power, and being so pushed between them it would not move either inward or outward and thus being immovable, being braced against the pressure of the ray shot toward the sun, by the pressure of the ray shot out into the void, against as great a mass, Triton's ray striking the sun's edge would, as we desired, turn that sun faster and faster, spin its huge mass faster, without affecting Triton itself. For the two great rays being so exactly balanced in power, Triton would not be affected in the least in its own positions or motions. There was needed, then, only a second great force ray to go out into space opposite in direction to that of the first. It meant, however, that since the first was radiating straight toward the sun from Triton's sunward side, the second must radiate straight away for her, on the sun from Triton's dark side, which would make the second ray point out into the void toward the constellation in which it would be in reference to the sun. That is, we calculated that by the time all would be ready for us to send the force ray in toward the sun, the constellation Sagittarius would be straight out from Neptune and the sun. Then the second ray would need to be sent out toward Sagittarius. For it would be then, against one of the great stars of Sagittarius, that this second opposing force ray would strike, to brace Triton against the other ray striking the sun, the star calculated best for that purpose being the bright star in the quadrilateral of Sagittarius. It was apparent, therefore, 
that when the great force ray was shot toward the sun, the second or bracing ray should be shot out against that bright star in Sagittarius to brace Triton against the first ray's push. Yet in reality, the problem was not as simple as that. For that star in Sagittarius, we well knew, lay like all the stars infinitely farther from us than the sun. It would require but a little more than four hours for the first great force ray, which travels, as you know, almost as fast as light itself, to reach the sun. But it would require a number of years for the second great force ray, traveling at the same speed, to reach the bright star in Sagittarius and strike against it. For even the nearest of the stars, of course, lies so far from our solar system, our universe, that it requires years for light to cross that colossal distance. In consequence, it would require as long or longer for the second force ray to cross such a great distance, traveling as it would at a speed almost that of light. Thus, since that bright star in Sagittarius that had been fixed upon lay dozens of light years from our solar system, it would require dozens of years for that second great force ray to reach that star. It was evident, therefore, that the second force ray would need to be shot out toward that star long before the first, since it was vitally necessary that the two rays strike their objects at the same moment. The first thing to do, therefore, was to prepare the great generators and send that second ray out toward Sagittarius. That work was begun at once, for only a short time was left us. On Triton's dark side, beneath the great roof, countless great generators were constructed, giant generators of the force vibrations which could by their massed power produce a colossal ray of unthinkable power. Then a great pit or giant well was sunk in the roof, one whose side sank down from the roof toward the surface of Triton. At the bottom of that great pit on Triton's surface was set the mighty mechanism or ray concentrator that would send the gathered power of all the massed generators driving out into the great void in one colossal ray. That mechanism was, of course, upon Triton's surface and was cut off from the rest of that surface by the metal walls that rose around it to the roof, since in that way it was possible to send the great ray out from Triton's surface through an opening in the great roof, the enclosing walls or sides of the pit preventing the warm air beneath the roof from escaping outward and keeping it airtight as ever. With that much done, the controls of the colossal ray and its generators were then constructed. Those controls were not single, but were repeated no less than twenty times, there being a score of control boxes for the great ray, set around the walls of the huge pit from which the ray would spring forth, and entered not from without, but from within those walls, of course. A single control box would have been enough, but our object in having a score of control boxes was clear enough. It was a matter of life or death for all the Neptunian races that those controls should function properly. If this great second force ray ceased, but for a moment to go toward the star in Sagittarius, as mentioned, the backward pressure of the other great force ray pressing against the sun would hurl Triton out of the solar system for all time, with all the Neptunians upon it. So those controls were not entrusted to a single control box, but were duplicated in twenty, so that if any one control box was destroyed or harmed in any way, or even if a half score or more were so destroyed or harmed, the great ray would continue to go forth. With that done, with the great generators ready, the ray mechanism or opening ready, and the control boxes and their intricate controls all completed, the first step was finished, and there remained but to turn on the giant ray, to send it forth to that bright star in Sagittarius. So on the day that had been designated, the Neptunians to whom had been entrusted the all-important watch of the twenty controls took their places in the control boxes. The great ray mechanism had been so placed in Triton's dark side, of course, that it pointed directly toward that star which the ray was to strike, and so it was needed only to turn on the giant ray. And so at last, with all the Neptunians gathered there beneath the roof around the walls of the giant pit, staring through those walls, transparent from within, we gave the word. Then, as one, the twenty controls were opened, and from the gathered throbbing generators from the great ray mechanism at the huge pit's bottom, there drove upward and outward into the great void of space the colossal force ray, visible only near its source as pale light, 
flashing out at almost the speed of light itself, on its stupendous journey across the void toward that bright star in Sagittarius that was its goal. There was no push against Triton, of course, when that colossal ray went forth, for there could be no push against Triton until that ray struck a solid body, struck the star that was its goal, and then it would push back against Triton. Just as if you reach forth to push yourself away from a wall, there is no push on your body until your hand reaches the wall. Not until dozens of years had passed, we knew, would that great ray strike the star in Sagittarius that was its goal, and not until then would come the back push against Triton, the bracing back push that was its purpose. And in those dozens of years, with the great ray shot ceaselessly forth to that star, of course, Neptune and Triton themselves would be moving somewhat, would be moving as Neptune followed its slow orbit around the sun. But so slow and so vast is Neptune's orbit movement that it would have moved but little, and as it moved, the ray mechanism would be turned constantly a very little, so that its great ray would still be directed ceaselessly toward the star in Sagittarius. And so that when that ray struck that star, Neptune and Triton would be just between or in line with the sun and that distant star. Thus half of our great task was finished, and there remained but to complete the other half, to make ready for the sending forth of the other great force ray, the first one as we called it, toward the sun. In the years that followed, while the great force ray traveled ceaselessly, on and on through the great void, toward that distant star that was its goal, we Neptunians were busy here upon Triton with the making ready of the newer force ray. On Triton's sunward side, directly opposite to the other force ray's source, we constructed again the great generators that would be used for this newer ray, massing them there beneath the great roof. With those generators finished, we began again to construct a great pit or well in the roof, and to place at its bottom the ray mechanism that would send this newer force ray in through the solar system toward the sun. Terrible years were those for us, though now at last this terrible time approaches its end. For in those years we had not only to keep on the immense task of constructing generators and mechanisms for the newer force ray, and to keep operating the other great generators and now a D mechanisms that were sending forth ceaselessly the great force ray toward Sagittarius. We had also to fight against the ever encroaching cold that was deepening ever its dread menace over us, and that seemed on the point of overcoming us even as we reached the climax of our giant fight against doom. For ever that cold on Triton grew greater as it grew still cooler at its heart, and ever we must make greater and greater efforts to keep operating the innumerable heat mechanisms that alone held death back from us. Yet we spurred ourselves onward by the thought that now at last we were appro approaching victory over this dread menace of cold that had beset us for so long. For at last the dozens of years required were drawing to an end, and the great force ray was fast nearing the star in Sagittarius that was its goal. So we labored on with all our strength, and soon the mechanisms of the new giant force ray were finished, its great pit ready in Triton's sunward side, and the twenty control boxes set in that pit's walls. Now at last was approaching the crucial moment of our great plan, that moment in which all must be calculated and performed with infinite care lest we meet disaster. The greatest of our scientists had many times in those years calculated the exact moment when the huge force ray we had shot forth would meet at last the star in Sagittarius, would strike against that star. It was necessary that the other giant force ray that we were to send forth against the sun would strike the sun's edge at the same moment exactly as the other ray struck that star, and with the same power exactly. So all was anxiety unutterable as we approached this great climax of our plan. By this time, scores of your Earth days ago, Neptune in following its orbit had moved so that it was almost exactly between the Sun and that distant star in Sagittarius toward which the ray was shooting. The fact that Triton revolved about Neptune did not impede that ray, of course, since as you know, Triton moves about Neptune in an orbit slanted greatly, inclined greatly from the ecliptic, and so even when on the outer side of Neptune, its ray would be able to go straight toward the Sun, through the upper limits of Neptune's atmosphere. And so in the same way, even when it was on the sunward side of Neptune, its great ray, 
that we had sent forth years before could shoot directly toward the star in Sagittarius. The only thing needful was that the ray we sent forth toward the sun be of the same power and strike it exactly when the other ray struck that distant star, so that they would push back against Triton with the same force at the same time. So intense anxiety we remained, and at last there came the moment for which we waited, more than four hours before the time when we calculated the other ray would strike the star in Sagittarius. And when that moment came, the signal was given, and the new mighty force ray was shot forth, from Triton's sunward side, shot forth toward that edge of the sun, turning away from us. That ray, of course, had no planets directly between it and the sun, we having chosen long before a time for the whole plan when this would not happen. But in the four hours and more that followed, we millions of Neptunians waited here on Triton with suspense unutterable. The moment was approaching when this giant force ray would strike the sun. If we had calculated wrongly, if the other giant ray did not strike that star in Sagittarius at the same moment, Triton would be hurled out to doom in the great void by the sun ray's pressure. Tensely we waited, and then at last there came the moment for which we had waited. That moment came and passed, that moment in which the new giant ray struck the sun, yet Triton did not move beneath its pressure. We knew that we had won, for the other ray had struck the star in Sagittarius at the same moment, balancing Triton against the pressure of the sun ray, and now as we observed the sun, we saw by our instruments that it was turning faster already. Its huge mass was spinning faster, as our great ray stabbed from Triton to press against that mass's edge with colossal force. Within the first Earth day, the pressure of that great ray against the sun's edge had increased the sun's speed of spin at almost the exact amount we had calculated, had decreased its rotatory period by four hours. And each day thereafter, the steady pressure of that colossal force ray has turned the sun ever faster at the same steady rate, has decreased its rotatory period by four Earth hours more. So that even as we had calculated, we saw, within 150 Earth days from the first sending forth of the sun ray, that the sun would be spinning so fast beneath that ray's pressure, its rotatory period decreased to the critical period of one hour that it would no longer be able to hold together and would divide into a double star. And even now that great plan which we, the Neptunians, and we, the Council of Thirty, carried out, comes at last to its fruition. For already more than one half of that time, more than eighty days have passed, and there remains hardly more than three score days before the great sun cataclysm comes. Hardly more than three score days from now the end, for all your inner planets, for all the planets save Neptune, will come, the sun reaching that critical rotatory period of one hour, and spinning then so fast, beneath the pressure of our great ray, that it cannot longer hold together, will divide into two suns that will whirl apart from each other, and engulf in their fires all the planets, save our own outermost one sending them with all their peoples to fiery doom. For to that doom we Neptunians are sending them to save ourselves from a doom, in another way, equally as terrible. 